Welcome to Live from One Cancer Place, the front door to patient land. Today, we're thrilled to bring to life a conversation that includes host Dr. Chris Heary, Chief Medical Officer of Arcelix, oncologist Dr. Heinz Joseph Lenz, and guest patient Julie Saliba Clower, a colorectal cancer patient. Additionally, we welcome Executive Director of the Wonderglow Foundation, Ms. Becky Keller, and together with a few of our veteran patients who populate and activate the growing membership of One Cancer Place. So what is OCP or One Cancer Place? We're a network of networks, all types of cancer veterans, experienced patients, caregivers, and stakeholders. We call our growing group, as I said before, the front door to patient land. The goal for our live pr productions is one that we hold dear. We want our followers and supporters to get to know our wonderfully dedicated cancer care professionals. We're lucky enough to make their acquaintances, have their support, and to learn so much from each conversation with which they grace us. We want to share them and their passion for patients with you, our audience. Please allow me also to acknowledge our supporting partners. We want to thank CGEN, our founding supportive partner for the live production. We also very sincerely want to thank our supporting uh, partners, Marathi Therapeutics, Natera Incorporated, and also supporting us as strategic partners are the Colorectal Cancer Alliance and the Colon Cancer Coalition. So please do go to One Cancer Place's YouTube channel, like us, subscribe, and get our notifications. And with that, Dr. Chris, will you take it away? By way of introduction to anyone who is tuning in for the first time on uh, this series that we call Live on One Cancer Place, um, you can go back and look at uh, older episodes as well. Uh, to get some more intro of where this idea came from. But as a, as a quick recap, uh, Erica, who is with us today, um, had an idea uh, years ago to try to help connect patients with people who could help usher them through the very complicated journey that is being diagnosed with and then dealing with their cancer um, through all of the various decisions uh, that occur. And as that has, as she spent more and more time in the advocacy world, uh, came to this idea that is now uh, the the uh, the driving idea behind One Cancer Place, which is to connect patients with other patients who already have been through some of those difficult decisions, have learned some things, uh, and are willing to share that experience and expertise with uh, patients that are going through it for the first time. Uh, to that end, live at One Cancer Place is uh, intended to sort of give a primer on some of those big questions, those big issues. Uh, and each one uh, of these is going to be introducing certain concepts with an expert uh, who has worked firsthand on those concepts. And in some cases, like today, we're lucky enough to also get a patient of that expert uh, to join us and give their perspective. Um, and we'll also hopefully uh, be joined today by a family that sort of drives another advocacy foundation that has supported Dr. Munz. And uh, we'll get some perspective on how all of that evolved as well. So um, that's, that's the intro to what we're going to be do doing today. And I would like to hand it over to Dr. Lentz to introduce himself uh, and maybe some of um, his, his main research interests so that we can uh, lay that, that groundwork down for where we're going from here. Thank you so much, Chris. And it's a pleasure to be here on and talk to you all. Um, I'm a GI oncologist at USC. Um, I'm actually the at, um, associate director for clinical science, and I'm co-leading the translational clinical science program, and I'm the co-director for Center for cancer drug development. And that basically sums up what I do. I see patients and in my laboratory, which I run, is I do early drug development. Um, we are very unique in a setting where we have one of the largest P3 
PDX model systems in the country, meaning every patient who undergoes surgery, including Julie, I collect the tumor from the surgical room and put it in a mouse and keep the tumor alive for testing new drugs. So we have been very successful. We are working at the moment at four different completely novel drugs for the treatment of colon cancer and beyond. These are not only potentially effective in colon cancer, we have also data in other cancers, including breast cancer. We have, I have a long track record here with cancer drug development with the NCI, um, where we have done academic drug development for the last 30 years and getting grants to, to do so. USC is very unique because we have on the one side, the Norris Cancer Center, which sees um, mainly the white patient population, the VIPs, and we have the county across the street where it is for patients from the county of Los Angeles who have no insurance and basically no one speaks English. It's all Spanish or Chinese or Korean. Uh, always attracted me because it keeps you humble and you keeps you in the real world. What is very important because we serve both patient population with the same clinical trials. In GI cancer alone, we run at any given time between 40 and 50 clinical trials, which is a major undertaking because I want to be uh, um, assured that I can give and provide access to new treatments to patients who may looking for better or alternative treatment um, options. To give you an idea that we are really very unique, um, the tumor location, right versus left, came from our laboratory. We found out early on that when we looked for biomarkers, it really mattered if the tumor was on the right versus left. These findings and its predictive value is now included in all international guidelines for treatments. We are running one of the biggest data sets in colorectal cancer because over 10 years ago, we wrote uh, into a clinical trial, one of the largest ever done in colon cancer, that we wanted to collect tissue, blood, plasma, and so on. And I got called very bad names to being crazy the least to do that. And today, it's the biggest resource of research on a molecular level for colorectal cancer. We were the first one who found that Parkinson protects against colon cancer and we are repurposing drugs to develop new drugs to prevent and treat colon cancer. We were the first one who found out that circadian clock, day and night rhythm, predicts the efficacy of treatments for colorectal cancer. And we can modify this rhythm with drugs which we are now developing in our mouse model and look very promising. We found that patients with Down syndrome are protected against any cancer, and we are actually developing a protein to mimic that in patients. Uh, but we are running into big problems, of course, money and peptide formulation, and then COVID, it was not an easy thing. We found a protein as the first one in the small bowel, which can kill colon cancer. We are trying to synthesize this protein, which we are running the same problem than with the Down syndrome gene. So just to give you an idea, we are not the typical GI cancer oncologists. We are really looking beyond and we are pushing the envelope as best we can. I think that patient advocacy is absolutely critical. And surely knows we actually, um, before COVID, have our annual colon cancer reception with over 100 people coming because I think without my patients, I couldn't collect the tissues. I wouldn't have their insights. It is absolutely critical for the success and progress of science to find better treatments, to have advocacy on our side. We just got an $18.5 million grant from the Moonshot program from um, Joe Biden's to really look at molecular characterization of Hispanics because they are very unique and these differences may help everyone to better understand. So I think I'm stopping here. Don't want to take all the time. I could talk for two hours. 
that was uh, a great insight. I think um, for for some of those who are listening in, we want to dive in a little deeper on some of those topics, and we will get there in just a minute. Before we do that, Julie, I would love to hear your perspective on uh, having been a patient of Dr. Lentz and um, just sort of how you've experienced uh, some of these things firsthand. Well, first of all, I didn't know he was trying to keep my tumor alive in mice when he's trying to kill it in my body. I, <laughs> nice I, I, try, nice <laughs> try. So, um, I so my my history to get to Dr. Lenz. I actually, when I was first diagnosed, I had um, a hemicolectomy right away. I was diagnosed with stage four cancer um, with Mets to my liver, and so they removed it from my colon. And then I had six weeks where I couldn't do anything. So I went on a shopping trip and shopped for an uncle. <laughs> Just basically, I figured in, in work, I, I interviewed more than, you know, more than one person for like a low level job on my team. So why would I just go to one oncologist? So I was also trying to decide city and whatnot. So I actually went to seven oncologist consults. And that was kind of my education in um, colorectal cancer. Because, you know, when I first was diagnosed, I, you know, I knew not to look at Google. But the first thing I did was looked at one Google question, which was, where is my liver? Because I had no idea where that was. So those consults were actually fantastic. They were, you know, excellent doctors, all of them. And, um, you know, treatment wise, it was pretty consistent. You know, they all said the same thing. Um, But when I met Dr. Lenz, he was the last of the seven. And I was told he was such a researcher that he probably would be in his lab and not look up from his microscope to talk to me. And when, that was totally the opposite experience that I had um, because he's an amazing clinician and you wouldn't know that he had all this research stuff if you you know were sitting in his um, clinic um, and didn't know all of that. And so I found, you know, immediately after that consult, we said, this is, this is the person. And again, it wasn't because his recommendation was that different. It was his thinking process and how he um, explained and talked about my treatment kind of overall and like the future. And so that was, I think, a critical thing that I learned, um, again, with my overkill of seeing so many doctors is that really, you know, part of it is their knowledge. And obviously, Dr. Lin's knowledge is unbelievable. But a lot of it is in kind of their clinical assessment and decision making and how they approach care that I think makes a huge difference in terms of finding a match for you. So, um, he was my perfect match and it's turned out to be that way because, um, because, you know, in terms of how he, um, looks at care, um, I think, you know, it's very much a chess game, if you will. So, you, you know, when he's talking to you about a treatment, he doesn't talk to you about the immediate impact only. He talks to you about kind of what does it mean for the next step? What does it mean for the step after that? So when you're in a long-term situation and you know that this is going to be a long, um, a long, not one treatment, treatment deal, thinking about, okay, what are the benefits of doing this now? What does it do in terms of later? And kind of that kind of strategic thinking about, um, about treatment has been really, um, really powerful and really insightful for me and very helpful in terms of how um, we've progressed. So I've never, never questioned his knowledge, but he also always approaches it from a, I I don't disagree. I mean, I don't always agree with his um, recommendation, but I, I know it's coming from a place of great knowledge, but also this idea of balancing. And I'd love to hear maybe if Dr. Lenz could talk about this, because I don't know how you can do this, right? Is being a scientist and knowing the numbers and the stats and whatnot, I feel like a lot of clinicians go with that versus using that to inform a specific patient's case. Um, And so that art piece of it, and how do you apply, you know, the population information to the specific patient and building your knowledge about that specific patient over time. I mean, there's been recommendations Dr. Lenz has made, like, for instance, I was, I'd been on full Fox had failed it. I'd been on full fury and failed it. And Dr. Lenz's recommendation was to do full Fox theory, which is all the same drugs, but together. And I'm sitting there going, that makes no sense, Mr. Because I've already failed both of those. Like, why would you do that? But, you know, he kind of explained why potentially that combo would be, you know, um, valuable to try together. And we did it and we did get more time out of it um, than, than probably we should have been, you know, watching it closely. So doing things like that, where he was thinking about me as a patient in the context of the data versus just what is this, what is the script, if you will, um, I think is what makes clinicians 
so amazing. And I think, you know, they have to do that, right? Because there's nothing that's 100%. If there was a 100% answer, none of us would be here. We'd all have taken that pill and we'd be done. Um, but you never know. So there was another patient who'd said, um, who had gone to another um, uh, oncologist who said, no one has survived the extent of disease you've had. There's no, nobody that has. So then came to Dr. Lenz and Dr. Lenz said, well, if that's true, and again, not debating whether it was true or not, but if that's true, why can you not be the first? And so that idea of, yeah, the data would say this, the research would say this, but that doesn't mean that there's not an opportunity to push beyond that and find um, a solution for you. So that whole art and science thing is the part that I don't understand how one brain can work and manage that. And I know oncologists need to do that all the time. But I think for me, that's been kind of the most... Um, powerful part of that is I feel like an individual, but being treated within the context of all this, um, all this science, if you will, that's very population based. So that's my story. And I, now I've been on this clinical trial that the, 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 the progression free survival, the median was two months and I'm, what is it? 21 months now with, um, <laughs> with still on, still on that trial. So I'm definitely an outlier, um, which we're both very, I think, very happy and maybe surprised by. Um, but that's kind of where we are. So I'm, so I'm, um, I've, 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 I have been the, the one, the one in, one in, one in not the typical response kind of um, scenario as well. Dr. Lentz, you mentioned uh, that your lab really led the way on the right versus left sided um, tumor location. Um, I've seen some of your work on RNA-seq correlations with outcomes. Um, and we've actually raised that topic in a, in a previous one of these uh, live at One Cancer Place. But we haven't had somebody who's been as sort of deeply involved in some of the decisions that led to those clinical efforts. So before we get to the actual data, the things that you've learned, could you talk us a little bit through the process by which you make a series of observations that allows you to then ask a question and, and then try to come up with a way to answer it? So it may be helpful to come back to the history, how I ended up, because I was trained in Germany with a very famous um, professor in hematology, oncology, and I finished my boards and I wanted to do science. He says, you should not go to the lab. You're very good with patients you will fail in science. And I'm thinking, how can, can you say that? Okay, so I didn't accept this. Okay, so I applied to go to Sloan Kettering for a scholarship uh, from the German government to learn. This was in the early 90s um, because in solid tumors, nothing happened. I mean, nothing. It was just very on standstill. Joe Bettino at this time, um, was one of the leading scientists. He worked on certain genes and chemo resistance. And I was ready to go to New York. I visited his lab. It was beautiful and wonderful. And a friend of mine who was in the lab said, don't give, go to Sloan Kettering, go to USC. And I, I didn't even, I never knew what USC was. And I thought I didn't want to go to LA. I wanted to go to New York. Okay. So he connected me with a lab at USC. And the lab was incredible, interesting, because the, the chief of this lab, Peter Dannenberg, was a postdoc at Charlie Heidelberger's lab. Charlie Heidelberger developed 5FU, okay? He was the founder of the USC Norris Cancer Center, and Peter was working on how 5FU worked. There was nothing else at this time, okay? But they developed, for the first time, PCR technology, Okay, they measured the genes in the tissues. It was the very early beginning of RNA technology. I read it and I knew, you know, when you know it is, this is the future, I knew this is the future. I changed all my travel plans and went to USC. Okay, so I grew up with RNA technology, gene expression, and I had to convince over 20 years people going from the DNA mutation to RNA gene expression because I believe that the answers are in the RNA. Can I, can I interrupt you for one second? Sure. Because I, I have had this conversation actually with some of the people on this call uh, who are listening, and I have found out that even though 
I assume that most people who have cancer have read about what is DNA and RNA and protein. It turns out it's a, it's a vanishingly small number that actually know, know what all of that I means. Could you, could you just give us the, the very, very quick version of how those things are related to each other? So the DNA has all the genetic information and it regulates the expression of genes which are translated into proteins, okay? And when the DNA is mutated, then it really has a downstream effect on different expression of genes. And after mutations were identified as one of the driving changes in cancer, they thought you just need to know the mutation to have all the information to make the best treatment decisions. And we have some examples, or oh, you probably heard about KVAS and NVAS and BVAF. These are the classical mutations which are used to make certain treatment decisions. But that downstream effect is not one gene, and it depends on other mutations. So to really better understand what the effect of a mutation is, you need to know what this mutation does in concert with all other changes in the cancer. And that signal is related to gene expression or protein expression. So we know that this may be, and this become in the future much more, it just takes time, but it has started that people do transcriptome analysis to better understand the functionality of what a DNA mutation really does to a tumor or tumor cell and what impact it has on chemo resistant or it, even its behavior. So I think this is a long story developing and I don't think the DNA is only the beginning. We will have so much more. When you now order a CARIS test for NGS testing, next generation sequencing panel, there is now a code AI, which is all gene expression to see if Folfox will work or not. That's all new. This all will become in the future much more that we better understand what is really important for certain treatment decisions. Well, thank, thank you for doing that. I, I think this is one of those things that we want to get across uh, to the community that will form in One Cancer Place around why it's important to understand some of the basic biology in cancer. Because it's really hard to understand why you would want to do RNA seq if you don't know what RNA is, right? So we've said this before on this program, but one of the things that every patient with cancer should do is get a very, very, very basic level of what DNA is, what RNA is, and what protein is, and how they're related to each other. All of the rest of the things that you're going to hear about will come into focus much more easily if you just go to the Wikipedia page and read it. And when you don't understand it, read it again, and then again, and then go ask your doctor, and then read it again. And I know it will be painful, but do it. All right. So, you, so Dr. Lentz, you said... Um, you, you joined this lab and you grew up in the world of looking at gene expression. You were a huge believer that gene expression was going to be the next big thing we understand about cancer. And I interrupted you. So I wanted you to pick it back up from there. No problem. So we, we did the first PCR. No one believed us. No one ever believed that it's possible. We could predict who benefited from 5 FU. Um, so we started to do the gene expression in the tumors. Um, it took years that we got our paper published. Um, they always had some criticism. No, no one believed in the RNA. So eventually, now then you had not five of you anymore. You had ivinotecan and you had oxaloplatin in the So the prediction of five of you didn't make any more sense. So we expanded to the angiogenic pathway, you know, the, the avastins of this world. So we checked VHEF, we, we checked EGF receptor, and we did this gene expression early on in the early 90s for all our patients, okay? I got the six genes and I knew if the patients will do well or not, just by the expression level, okay? So this is, of course, now developed in a much more complicated way, and we are now looking at all DNA mutational pathways. We look at transcriptome analysis, um, and that is becoming more and more important in order to find a treatment algorithm. Or right now, because of the data, um, uh, the volume of the data for each patient, I just had a my, my talk before this was with a computer scientist or with artificial intelligence and machine learning. How can we help more 
because I can be only as smart as I can be, but I cannot fully ask questions. I have no idea what I should ask. So computers can help us to see clusters of patients and what is unique about them and find really novel ways. That is how we found out Parkinson, or because my bioinformatician says this signatures of 50 genes predicts if this drug will work. And I'm saying, what in the hell? What do I do with these 50 genes? I need to know the biology. Otherwise, how can I make it better or understand it? So he says, okay, okay, I will do a dimension deduction. I had no idea what that is, but I said, I need to know what's the major player and why that is. And the gene which came out was alpha synuclein. I had to Google it because I didn't know what it was. And it was the diagnostic test for Parkinson. And I'm thinking, oh, shoot. In 30 years, I have not seen one colon cancer patient with Parkinson's. Not one. That is impossible. I called my colleague in um, UCSF, Dr. Venuk, who has Parkinson, by the way, a GI oncologist that says, guess what? You will not develop colon cancer. He says, why? I said, because you have Parkinson's. He says, oh, shoot, I never saw a patient. And so that's how we started the whole new, um, newer, the newer transmitters as a new target for colon cancer. So the molecular technologies can be extremely helpful. And sometimes we stumble on it. Okay, it's not necessarily always the great idea. It's just because you ask certain questions and you just need to be very conscientious. When something doesn't fit, there is a good reason. You cannot give it up. You have to figure out why. And sometimes you find out something very important, like the Parkinson's. So I think the RNA, and from that on, we always did genetic expression level for our patients. And as soon as NGS became a, 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 um, available, we did um, a company, a spin-off of USC response genetics. We used them. Then I started working with Caris. I forced them to do RNA-seq, which they now do. And it is just an incredible resource. And we are only on the beginning to understand these data points, okay? Um, so I'm very optimistic in the future. We will really change the way we do treatments in the future based on whole genome sequencing. I have no doubt whole genome will come, okay, and not only targeted panels. I'm embracing this development. I'm not afraid of it because I think the more we know, the better we make treatment decisions. Yeah, I, I wanted to uh, go one layer deeper on this process because, as you said, we have been stuck in a level of mediocrity in uh, GI cancer outcomes for quite a while. We've seen massive improvements in outcomes in lung cancer, melanoma. Um, you could argue over the last 30 years, the outcomes in breast cancer have changed radically uh, in that period of time, maybe, maybe closer to 40 years. Um, but in GI cancers, there's been, uh, especially let's take colon cancer as maybe the best example of this. There's been just, hey, we have some drugs that work we should be happy. Let's try these in 800 different combinations of the exact same drugs, but not really understand what we're doing and for which patient and why. And I find it really interesting um, that you say, you know, 25, 30 years ago, you, you saw the science behind gene expression and said, I just knew that this had to be the thing. And we still haven't fully made that transition in that period of time, despite the fact that I saw something similar about 15 years ago. And I said the same thing. I was like, I don't know why everyone isn't doing this all the time. And then we saw some publications in the mid 2010s that even said that this was true in colorectal cancer. And then you did some retrospective analyses of actual outcomes in patients treated with various treatments and saw that there were differences in outcome. Why has this not hit the mainstream? How do we get from here to there. Yeah. And why do, does it feel like so often we're in this catch 22 where people will say it hasn't been proven to already help us make a decision. So I'm not going to do it. Well, at the same time, someone like you can say, I am confident it will. We just need to do the work to show it. How do we break that? Cycle? Yeah. So I think there are many factors playing into the slow development integration in the clinic. Okay. So just to let you know that the gene expression has made a big difference because 
we used the gene expression and created four different subgroups of colon cancer. It's called CMS. We published that. We showed the outcome, predictive and prognostic. So, and this is a very unique, that's not done in any other cancer. These are biological distinct four different colon cancers based on gene expression. They are not trained based on outcome. They're trained on their unique activation of pathways. They are already used in drug development. So when you have a drug inhibiting one pathway and this pathway is in the group one, you only will treat group one patients. So that is already implemented. The question is, why is it not, why can we not get the results? Caris would have the results possible. It is all about FDA approval and what they can state because with RNA-seq, you cannot really identify a gene or a signatures very easily. So it is about clear approval of this technology to use it in a clinical manner. So now MD Anderson just finished uh, I think a 48 gene panel, which can actually do this classification. And that will help because this classification can tell you when Erbitax works, when Zetuximab, uh, when Avastin, uh, Avastin works, when Fulfiri works, and when Folfox. But you cannot order it yet because it needs to be done in a clear approved lab. And for RNA-seq, that does not exist yet. So it's an approval system. Okay. Now, for colon cancer, and that is a big misunderstanding, uh, what you just said is we made progress, but here is the problem with, with lung cancer and melanoma, okay? You fragment out the diseases more and more, or you have now the EGF receptor mutations, you have the MSI and so on. The median in colon cancer improved, okay? So the median A is now over 30 months. But what was colon cancer is completely different than any other metastatic disease. We can cure colon cancer, but we don't cure the majority. So the median, what is reported, doesn't change, but suddenly the curve has a shoulder and it doesn't go down. So we have cured more and more patients because the pattern of colon cancer is completely different. If you have breast cancer and it metastasizes, you're done. There is no cure. For colon cancer, that is not true. If the tumor doesn't come back for colon cancer for five years, you are cured. Now, why is that not happening in the majority of patients? Because colon cancer is very heterogeneous, meaning colon cancer is consisting out of many different colon cancer cells. Even they look the same, but they're not the same. When you treat, you have always resistant clones which grow out. So the population, you can imagine that when you put 1,000 people on a football field, everyone is different, but they look like they're all people. That is colon cancer, but everyone is different and can escape certain treatments. That is not the same for other cancers. So there is really a limitation to the biology in colon cancer. There is... Um, the, the in integration of certain novel RNA technologies to be going along, be approved by federal agency to integrate that. It's already done in drug development. And then the treatment development at the moment is stuck at the immune therapy because colon cancer goes mainly in the liver. Now, if you have liver lesions, immune therapy will not work. For other cancer, it goes to other sites. So the tumor microenvironment, which we are now really focusing much more, it's not only with the tumor alone, but where the tumor sits plays a very important role. And for colon cancer, it's different than for other cancers. So there are a lot of factors going into it where it presents very unique opportunities, but also challenges because the liver is the only organ which can grow back. Okay, we can operate the liver one, two, three, four, five times because it grows back. That's the reason for colon cancer. When they have liver disease, I, my treatment goal is cure and not palliative anymore because we can go after with successful treatments. What is also very important, and I think that's often um, a misunderstanding for many oncologists, 
you don't wait and save certain drugs for later. Okay? Don't. You cannot use them later. They lose efficacy. You always have to give the best treatment up front, not thinking, then I use it later. Thinking, oh, then I have something for later is uh, completely wrong. It has been shown. It seems like the, the doctors are, don't want to have something in safety to give it later, you know, but it's the wrong approach. You have to really do the best at any given time because the cells you kill and the cells survive under treatment are not the same and the sensitivity changes. So the treatment you think could have worked will not work later on. So there are a lot of, and that is because colon cancer is composed out of so many different little colon cancer cells which really distinguish each other dramatically. So uh, a good analogy for that that I've heard people use is, uh, well, I've heard people talk about it in terms of insects um, or because most people can understand that. Like if you have a very active way of eliminating every single roach, you want to you do you want to get rid of the last one. You don't want to leave one behind because then they'll make more and more baby roaches exactly. figure out better ways around exactly. whatever you use, right? And I just wanted to give that analogy for anybody listening who's thinking, well, well, I don't really understand. When we think about cancer, a lot of times what we're thinking about is evolution, just in hyperspeed. And if you're not really familiar with concepts of evolution, if you put pressure on any species or any, any group of things, the one that survives tends to be the strongest one. And so if you didn't eliminate the last one, you've now created a problem for yourself. And I think what Dr. Lenz was sort of hinting towards here is we don't really love this idea of saving bullets in the gun. We'd rather use them all if we can get rid of everything, every last one. This is, I will say, this is a very different concept than what I was taught in fellowship. I, I, absolutely. Not by, not by everyone, but by many, is that you should use a sequence of therapies with minimal toxicity to keep people alive as long as possible. And then there were other people, because I went, I trained in a place where there were controversial ideas shared frequently, who would say, no, you need to hit it as hard as you can and kill every last cell you possibly can. And it was a raging debate. I will say like in our, you know, uh, our scientific discussions, you, people would- and, and There's still pockets around. I, I, I always- I hate this concept of waiting later on and so on, because I think it's just ignorance of really the biological factors, okay? Um, I think it's also very important, you know, where colon cancer comes from. Or it comes from the colon inlining or from the mucosa. Now, you need to know that the intestinal mucosa in the colon is one of the fastest growing normal cells. They can grow faster than colon cancer cells. Okay, so you and it is very important. The normal colon starts in the crypt and it proliferates, it grows in order to replace the old one. And then when it comes up the crypt, it differentiates out to make sure it does what it needs to do to absorb fluids and so on. So there is a very sophisticated pathway which allows that. I mean, the programming is very complex. Oh, you have to grow and then you have to make and grow and differentiate out very quickly. So it is an incredible history how that pathway was discovered. Okay, there was a German um, scientist, Christina nüsslein Follard, who got the Nobel Prize for it. She found the gene which was responsible for the development of the wings in Trosophila and she called it wingless, okay? That gene was very important. Now, there was a Stanford professor, I think his name was Smith, and he found the same genes, he called it INT because it was a transcription factor. So one is the growth, the other one is the differentiation. And this is exactly altered in colon cancer. Basically 98% have this because if something goes wrong in this development of growth and differentiation, you develop colon cancer, okay? And this wind pathway is very difficult to treat. 
And that is one of the mechanisms of resistance where we get into a trouble in order that we cannot easily develop a cure, okay? So because it's so complex, many companies around the world try to develop inhibitors of this pathway. They all failed because you cannot inhibit this pathway because you have too much toxicity. So you need to modulate it. And that's what they're trying to do right now because if they find it, they will have a cure. But it's easier said than done, okay? So I think that is a big difference between other cancers. So how it develops and how it becomes, of course, then creates different challenges for treatment. I don't know how many of our audience will have followed this, but there was uh, a therapeutic agent evaluated uh, and presented at GI ASCO this year that is targeted uh, somewhat towards that, that WIMP pathway, the DKK1 targeted agent. Uh, I'd love to hear your perspective on whether uh, you, you ev eventually see subgrouping of patients and selection of treatment based on gene expression and based on which of those genes is overexpressed in such a way that you believe, yeah. uh, you know, that at least, you know, 80 plus percent of patients will do best with this therapy versus this therapy versus this. Do you think we're on our way there? Yeah. Uh, so I think the, 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 the DKKR1 is actually an interesting gene because we found it in our database to do something very unique, not known. But the, the, all the targeting of the upstream wind will not, will not work. We have done so many trials targeting. Uh, I think that will be a big challenge. However, I really dearly believe, okay, that the molecular subgrouping um, of colon cancer will be a key to develop more successful drug. Because when you think about it, when you take a drug and you treat everyone, or, and maybe a few um, are seeing sh show some response, this drug will be abandoned because it's not enough. But when you would enrich in this group and you would see 10, 20 percent response, it would probably survive. So not selecting based on what the drug does. And that what does what do the pharmaceutical industry do? It's all about targeting or targeting certain genes, certain mutations. So these mutations or these pathways are found in very unique groups, not in everyone. How can you not select? Or I think the problem with, as I mentioned before, with the CMS classification is that, um, that labs had no clear approval to do it, okay? And I think that may be overcome in the, in the near future. But in drug development, when you talk to companies and the new drugs in, in their animal models, they use the CMS classification already. When you have a TGF beta, it's CMS4, you know? If you have a, a metabolic pathway, it's, it's CMS3, you know? And we, we already use this on a scientific level. I know exactly what genes are enriched or metabolic disorders are enriched in what pathway. Obviously, when you want to have an intervention, you start with this. If it doesn't work in them, it will not work in the rest. So I want to um, maybe just define a couple of terms that you just, just mentioned. Um, uh, the, those subtypes that Dr. Lentz mentioned earlier are uh, defined by the pathways that drive the, or at least they were uh, without any bias identified to overexpress certain pathways that are related to uh, their growth potential. And it is believed that since those genes and their expression are upregulated sort of in an unbiased way in these groups, that they may also be driving the behavior of those tumors. And so if you could attack the thing that is driving the tumor's growth, uh, then you might have a, a treatment modality. But to, to uh, one other point that Dr. Lentz just made, there, there is something called upstream and downstream of certain genes that turn into proteins. And I just wanna make sure everyone knows kind of what that means. So there are things that control the expression of a gene that controls other genes. Uh, and then there are genes like, like one that may be super important that actually control the regulation of other genes within the cell, right? And so one of the tricks in cancer biology is to understand which one of those is the master driver. And if one of those master drivers is also normal, it becomes very hard to go after, right? Because you can't eliminate something that you need in your normal cells. But Dr. Lenz also kind of touched on something that's a really interesting concept, which is 
can you take advantage of a cell overusing a gene versus the normal use of that gene in a normal cell? And that's an area of cancer therapeutics that is really exploding right now, trying to, trying to figure out, can you find a window of opportunity for the certain use of a certain drug that would eliminate a certain protein just enough in bad cells, but not in good cells? And so that's just, there's a lot of complex biology there. We're not going to get into all those details, but I did want to make sure we, we at least give some yeah, timer mean- on that. One of the most exciting data I've ever seen is many years ago, you know, it was a concept to drive the cells into suicide, you know? So when you have an activated pathway in a cancer cell, it usually helps to grow, huh? but you can stimulate it so much that everything collapses, okay? So it was even making it worse. Um, it's easier said than done, but I think it's a very, it, because usually cancer drugs are inhibiting, stopping, you know? And these drugs were looked for to drive it even more and drive it to basically off the cliff. Okay. Um, it didn't, it didn't develop into any drugs yet, but I thought it was a very smart concept. You know, I was taken, I never thought about that. So. I think some of these topics that you've touched on are so relevant to the complexity of the decisions that patients now face. Right. Um, one other, one other quick one that Dr. Lentz mentioned is CLIA approved assays. And that's not something most of you are going to know what that means. So quickly, I'm going to give you an overview of that too, which is um, that is a certification. And essentially what that means is that some central body has reviewed the ability of a lab to do a test and be able to get consistent results over time. So that if you gave the same lab from the same day and they tested it without knowing, they would get the same results over and over and over again within some range of, uh, of, of error that is acceptable. And one of the challenges we have with things like RNA-seq is that historically you can send it to one lab or another lab or another lab and actually get different results. And that's, and that's been one of the big challenges. Um, so I just wanted to point out that even though this all sounds fantastic, you do have to be very cautious about who is doing the actual tests that you're trying to get your answer from. So that's why I think, and Dr. Lentz, maybe you can comment on this, but working with somebody like Karis, who has the ability and the knowledge to know how to do a test so that it meets all those regulatory standards is really important. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's also important for payment, you know, and it has a lot of um, regulatory impact. So we have working with Karis um, because I think they have impressed me that they're very, they're listening, you know, uh, they are one of the few labs who do transcriptome analysis, who do HLA testing, who do the code AI. And, um, but the thing is when they report something and the physician would act on it, this needs to be all validated and really sound proof. This is not the same than research um, in, the, in the lab or research in drug development. So I'm always pushing them, breathing in their neck that they do the same. They can technically do it, but they need to be approved by the agency that they can put the data down and saying what it means. So I, unfortunately that takes always some time, but I, we are going full blown in this direction. And I think the next forefront is really whole genome because you, you understand the genes we are testing today is for all cancers, okay? There are genes in colon cancer we may miss, okay? So I want to know every single gene in every patient to make sense out of it. I may not understand many of them, but not looking is not solving the problems either. So I need to make sure that, um, that this is all done the best we can. And I know I'm not worried about finances in, and not, not that I'm, I, I'm always worried, but I, I, I'm driven by science and data, okay? I try to figure out the finances later, but not to do it. And the prices are coming down, you know? I mean, Five, 10 years ago, nobody thought we could do an NGS, okay? Uh, and I'm sure in five years, we do a whole genome, okay? It's all coming down as it's all technologized and robotized, and it will be done. And I think the challenges is the increasing knowledge gap of this technology and the genetic information to put that into clinical recommendation. And I can only feel only respect for community 
oncologists to see all the different cancers and have to deal with all the different genetic changes and, ch uh, and new findings. I, I would not be able to do that. Um, so I'm very um, happy that I'm in my little expertise thing, at least to keep up to date. I, they cannot do it. I mean, it's impossible and I would completely falter, okay? So all our fellows who go out, they always call me and say, what's new in colon? I don't want to miss anything. And they're thinking, wow, they have to be really on the tip of their toes all the time. Yeah, I did. Um, I, I saw Becky joined us and I want to um, maybe ask uh, to her to introduce herself and uh, the Wonder Glow Foundation and, and, um, and give a little bit of a background book just so we don't lose this one thread before we do that, I did want to ask one follow-up to that, which uh, that you were just saying, Dr. Lentz, which is um, around this concept of being able to identify gene sequences or gene expression profiles across tumor types. Um, you, you mentioned earlier that the tissue from which colorectal cancer derives impacts the disease. And I'm sure that's, probably something you believe is true for all of the other cancers as well. So do you think that the gene expression profiles that we see that are relevant for treatment in colon cancer will be the same as certain lung cancers or uh, pancreatic cancer or whatever, or do you think there'll be different profiles and we have to look at them? That I, I think they're different. Um, you know, it's interestingly, when we look at pancreas cancer or colon or uh, stomach cancer, which they do very poorly, that the survival has not changed too radically. There are not bad genes in it. They, we cannot blame any of the bad genes. It's just where the, these cells arrive from that they have different resistance. The growth pattern is different. So it's not easy to see on a genetic level why they're doing so poorly. Now, the interesting, the right side colon is almost like small bowel and um, stomach cancer. Their survival is very similar. Um, even the genes are not the same, you know, because genes reflect what the tissue does. Or So if you have a stomach cell, the stomach cells does different, have different jobs and tasks than a colon cell or like a pancreas cell. So what act, genes are activated in the finally function of the cells and it will become cancerous has different properties than other cells because they are all determined. They know what they're supposed to do and something goes wrong. But because what they were told or supposed to do goes wrong, that activity is of course not the same than when a cell develops cancer from a different purpose. Yeah, um, similar to a, uh, you know, you could have a raccoon that has a bad attitude or a dog that has a bad attitude, but they, they might have gotten there in very different ways. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> yes. Um, all right. So, uh, Becky, would you mind introducing yourself and, and the foundation and um, how, you, how you're uh, related uh, with Dr. Lentz? That'd be really helpful. Sure, absolutely. My name is Becky Keller, and I'm the president and executive director of the Gloria Borges Wonder Glow Foundation. So Gloria Borges, my only child and brilliant daughter, um, was diagnosed with stage four colon cancer at the age of 28. Um, Dr. Heinz Joseph Lenz was her oncologist. And they were kind of they were kind of two minds that, you know, separated at birth that were always supposed to meet and collaborate together, um, very meant to be. Um, she uh, started a blog called Wonder Glow. Uh, Wunder in German means miracle. We're actually Wunder Glow. Uh, Wunder in German means miracle and glow is Gloria. So she started a blog that became read in over 135 different countries by over 100,000 unique visitors. She realized one year later that she needed to go bigger. People were asking her about her diet, her exercise, her fitness, her regimen. And um, one year after her stage four uh, colon cancer diagnosis at the age of 28, she founded the Wonder Glow Foundation. Um, and her mission was clear to eradicate and fund uh, curative uh, colon cancer research. Um, for her at age 28, no familial history, no genetic, no Lynch syndrome, no FAP, um, and no real symptoms to speak of, what she said people like her need are the cure. She felt that it's a very underfunded cancer. She didn't see a lot of the other uh, colorectal cancer organizations doing this. Everybody has their own specialty, and she thought, this is where I'm going with it. She started Wonder Glow. We were founded in 
in September 2011. Um, she brilliantly ran it for two and a half years, started our capital campaign called the Wonder Project, has funded our Wonder Project research to date, has funded over $1.55 million, primarily to uh, Dr. Lenz oversees it. He's on our board of directors. And um, we've also funded research at Stanford uh, Medical. And um, our, our mission is clear, it's complete, and we're not stopping until cancer does. We've also created programming called the Children of Wonder Glow. We know that colorectal cancer takes parents away from their children. So we're a group community. We're trying to end this disease. But we also care about the children that are affected. And they really are a unseen audience. Everybody, you know, cares and supports children who have cancer and are in the hospitals. Of course, you need to support them. But this little small community are children that are dealing with their parents' diagnosis. Um, we've already funded 28 scholarships to children who have lost a parent to colorectal cancer. And since 2016, we give presents to the children whose parents either have cancer or have survived cancer or families who have lost uh, their um, mom or dad to cancer throughout the country, locally, and we reach one family in Malaysia and one family in Canada with our holiday gifts. We also do free Reiki and guided meditation monthly for cancer patients, caregivers, family members, and um just moving and booming and we just can't end until uh, stop what we're doing. And as long as Dr. Lenz and his brilliant team are doing their amazing research, we have to fund what we believe will bring uh, greater efficacy, uh, uh, treatments with less side effects and these immunotherapies and drugs and combination treatments that are going to cure people. And that's my daughter's mission. Um, losing my only child who cancer took away her ability to have children. I'll never be a grandmother. But Gloria left the Wonder Glow Foundation as my baby to take care of. So I didn't create it. I added the DBA, the Gloria Borges Wonder Glow Foundation, because in her absence, her presence not being here, I never wanted anyone to know that I created it for her. I didn't. She left these shoes beside my bed, and I'm brave enough to put them on and walk in them every day. And that's what I take credit for. This is just a funny coincidence how life, you know, how the, it's a small world, but I uh, interacted with your daughter many times about Duke basketball games. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 and this weekend, oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, well, we, I was, this was over Twitter, uh, just complaining about calls and things. And, <laughs> uh, and I ended up, we ended and not up talking surprising a couple at times. All. Yeah. yeah we, we ended up talking a couple times about her, uh, her, her work uh, to support Dr. Lentz and, uh, and all yes. that. I was, I was still in a uh, fellowship at NCI at the time. So oh, just wonderful. A and his funny daughter, coincidence. Debbie, his daughter, Debbie Shashevsky Savarino sits on our board of directors. And, oh, he's nice. part, yeah, and he's part of our honorary advisory board of the wonder project. And we've done three on three basketball, go to hell cancer basketball tournaments. <laughs> Dr. Lenz, um, you were there for in 2014, the year Gloria passed away. He yeah. went to Durham with us and he says to me, you know, Becky, I know that cancer is bad, but do we have to be that crass and say, go to hell? And I said, you know, Dr. Lenz, in the polite South, everybody in the state of North Carolina knows what go to hell cancer means. <laughs> Duke Carolina is the big rivalry. They say, go to hell, Duke. And Duke says, go to hell, Carolina. So it was not, it's not unusual to the polite South that that was the name of our three on three basketball tournament there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we are uh, we're coming up on time. I want to be respectful of Dr. Lenz's time. He he joined us late because we had some technical issues. Um, I wanted to see. I wanted to bring this full circle to Julie. Um, you know, somebody who has probably felt some of the impact of the Wonder Glow Foundation and and its support of Dr. Lenz. And maybe if you could give us some closing thoughts on some of the conversation, some of the things you've heard today, and how. Um, how you think about them and frame them up. I think that'd be a great way to close out. How I think about them, I think mainly is that I don't understand them, um, which is okay because Dr. Lenz understands them. So, um, so I think it's exciting. And just the, just the energy, I think, hearing how many different ways there are to think about ways to attack this, you know, horrible go to hell cancer situation that we have going on. And the fact that there, there is constantly that kind of um, 
drive to think about it in new ways and different ways and how to, you know, bring in different things like Parkinson's and like, you know, doc, like Dr. Lenz, I think the idea of when something doesn't fit, there's a reason and that constant curiosity to figure out that reason, I think at the macro science level, but then also at a patient level is really um, compelling and really powerful because I am alive because of it. You know, I, I absolutely was, you know, not, not in good shape and we just, you know, kept going and did the best, you know, treatment option at the time. And, um, and that's how I'm here. And so both from the research that Dr. Lenz has done um, from Wonderglow funding it. And also beyond that, I think um, it, it has impacts on individual patients, even if that specific research isn't at the point of, you know, clinical use yet, because it does all infiltrate into every decision that's being made for patients today, which I think is, you know, why it's so exciting for me, because it's not like sitting here saying, you know, a lot of patients say, well, that's great, but that's in the future. And I'm not going to be, you know, that I need treatment today, not in the future, but all of it has an influence on what can be done today. Um, Anyway, you know, does that make sense? So it's not, it's not like, oh, I I just wish I was, you know, (laughs) like, you know, diagnosed years from now. No, it's like, it really is having an impact today, even if it's not totally um, baked in, in, you know, in the guidelines and part of, uh, part of clinical practice commonly. So I I may want to add, I think the biggest impact for the Wunderklo Foundation, and, you know, I know that Shuli has supported Wunderklo uh, significantly is, it gives me the liberty to be a little bit crazy or I do not have to plan a writer grant for three to six months to get money for something I have to show it works. I can go high risk, high impact. All our advances are done spontaneously because of ideas in the clinic, ideas in the lab and translated to the next level and want to see if it's true and what do we need to do. We created this whole animal facilities. We can now test drugs very successfully. So without the the funding, this philanthropic, which is unrestricted, I don't have to justify and saying, I need now the $5,000 to buy this enzyme, whatever. I think gives me incredible power and I don't have to worry about can I afford the $55 now or not. I just do it. If this sounds like it is, I go after. And the protocol truly is on, was purely seen on a clinical trial, had nothing to do with the the combination. We saw immunotherapy and then we put patients afterwards on another drug, it suddenly worked better. And we already knew the combination. That was something. So I said, let's do the combination. It took us three years to get the drugs from the companies to buy in. Okay. The Japanese beat us on this because they have an easier way. So, But it's still <laughs> proof of concept. We showed it can work. But what I'm saying is this is all possible to put this together. We needed the preclinical day. I mean, one goes into the other. And actually, you mentioned, I think you're absolutely right. All the little steps go to the next level. And if you don't do these, you never go anywhere. You know, so sometimes there are bigger, smaller steps and bigger steps to make it possible. And if I can add one more thing as well, to know Dr. Lenz is to sincerely love him and to have the belief and the trust. He's tireless. He's a tireless um, clinician. He's in the office before everybody is on holidays. He's in here on the Sundays. He has dedicated his life to finding a cure for these patients specific and they're complex and all unique in and of themselves. Might do surgery on someone so that they can qualify for the next immunotherapy. So He sincerely is there trying to save each and every patient's life and get them to the cure, not for his track record, but for their life. And he's just an incredible person and resource. And we're blessed and just grateful to have him as part of our colorectal cancer leadership. When I listen to her, I think she must talk to somebody else. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I think I think that it is interesting, though. Also, just like in, in observing this, obviously, I know Dr. Lenz's research is vast, and I know he has fifty clinical trials running, and he, you know, and he tells me the little pieces of some of this stuff, you know, in my appointments, and so I know it's vast. 
but I know him as my oncologist. And so it's very fascinating to be on this call, you know, or, you know, hear it all because, or anytime I hear Dr. Lenz speak about the science that he's doing is to me, like no offense, Dr. Lenz, because I know he prefers to be considered a researcher than a clinician, but like, it's like, no, but it's almost like, 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 like this is his side job. His real job is like saving my life. And that, you know, and, and, and as a patient, that's how I see him. So I think it's, you know, really fascinating to see kind of actually his side job is kind of saving my life. I don't even know. But in, when I'm in the clinic, like I assume that, you know, that's what he's doing all day yes. long. Yes. Um, when really, you know, he has this whole vast other stuff that he does, which is like unreal. So every time I hear more and more about it, I'm like, how does one person do all this stuff? Because <laughs> his, his work ethic is extraordinary yeah. and sincerely unmatched. Yeah, you tell well, that to my wife and I'm not coming yeah. home, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Lentz, it sounds like you have a lot of uh, very appreciative patients out there. And uh, we appreciate you taking the time to walk us through some of these key issues in not just colorectal cancer, but all of cancer uh, research and how how we frame these ideas uh, as we think them through for patients. And I, it sounds like even patients who have been exposed to these ideas uh, still need a lot more uh, of the right words, uh, uh, the right guidance to walk through them. And we hope that these types of conversations will help with that. Yeah, no, I think these are so critical. I could, cannot be more appreciated that you're doing what you're doing because I think the more patients understand of the complexity, ask the right question, my life is easier. You know, I love it. I love people who are informed because um, it's so much easier to, to, that they understand what we are doing and where we are coming from. And I think very important for me, the patient is the center of everything. Um, everything else in the lab, I want to gain additional tools to be more successful in the clinic, not the other way around. And I, I think patient advocacy, which is very unique in the United States, it doesn't exist the same level in Europe or in Asia, you know. So you have this incredible power and infiltration and support system, which is so important, you know, um, uh, in order that people are informed and know where to go and what questions to ask. I, I very much appreciate that because it is so critical to make sure that patients um, get the best treatment possible and have access to the best new treatments. I'm going to hand it back over to Erica from here. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, I'm thinking because we have been talking for about an hour and a half that we've all had a good chance to jump in and discuss. Uh, I know that I'm holding a question from a, a patient in one cancer place that I'm going to just send to Dr. Lenz personally in an email. Uh, maybe some of our other guests have questions. Monterey, uh, you may have a question. Leslie, I don't know if you had a question that Dr. Lenz is so gracious to be staying the whole hour and a half with us. We might as well take a quick advantage. Yes, take advantage now. <laughs> <laughs> so my question is this. Um, you mentioned that that Keras isn't able to put a CMS categorization in the in the report. Yes, but is the the data that they do report? Can you translate that into CMS? No, 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 no. no. It's it's an algorithm. It's a very complex thing. So they have it. They can do it. it it's just. It has to be approved by the overseeing uh, agencies. I think it will happen very soon. But they told me they're very clear there. So sometimes I call them and say, what is it that I know of it, you know? Um, mm. But it is still not official because if it is linked to treatment decision, it has to be very tightly regulated. You know, it, it's not considered a re research anymore. So when I ask, I say, this is for research. Otherwise, they wouldn't tell me. Well, very quickly, I'll ask you this question, Dr. Lenz, that comes to, came to me, and it was a, a specific question about on Vansertib. Yes. Is, can it be used for HRAS or NRAS? Yeah, so that's a very good question. I, I, I had the same question to the company. This is a protocol we wrote at USC with the company because they wanted to know how they move forward for this uh, drug which targets KVAS mutant tumors. 
all their data in preclinical testing was KVAS. It should be the same for NVAS and HVAS. But when they wrote the protocol, it was for KVAS with the FDA. So they could not enroll NVAS and HVAS, okay? So that's, it's kind of more a technical issue. The NVAS and HVAS are less frequent. So the majority is actually KVAS, but it should work for NVAS and HVAS too. That's a very good question. Didn't come from me, came from one of our patients. No, no, but what I'm saying, it's very, <laughs> it's very smart because we could, could not enroll and I argued with them, but it is not the scientific argument, it's the regulatory uh, ah, argument. Ah, that is because, so helpful. Yeah. That is so helpful. Yeah, I had um, a rare kind of cancer, which they could never really explain to me. My tumor was on the outside of my colon. Okay. The inside, so even a colonoscopy didn't catch it. Yes. They took it was a silent killer. Um, what do you do about something oh, like that? Yeah. You can't do anything. Oh, that's a, Monterey, that's a very good question because here gene expression comes into big place. So what they can do, they have a special program and make sure use the tumor and their gene expression level to say, is this consistent with colon or any other primary tumor? So when they don't know where the primary tumor comes from, with the gene expression, they can tell you it's 99% of breast cancer, 99% of duodenal cancer, 99% of colon cancer. So um, it should not be on the outside because then it doesn't come from the crypt. So in this case, you can do a, a test with transcriptome analysis to better understand what the origin of this tumor is. Thank you. I have another quick question, Dr. Lenz. Yes. When you say gene expression, do you mean RNA yes. expression? Okay. Gene is RNA, okay? Okay. Protein is protein, and they do it with immunistic chemistry, okay? And DNA is DNA, okay? But genes are usually when we refer to RNA expression. So I want to let Dr. Chris know that I'm going to go to Wikipedia, and I'm going to study and study and study and try and understand. And, you will, and Chris, you can test her in a week or so. We will. Well, <laughs> Erica's not telling you that I've already given her a one-on-one -on -one lesson on <laughs> protein a couple times, but it is not an easy thing to stick. You have to use it conversationally. I am yeah. not a science uh, major. <laughs> yeah. No. <laughs> Unfortunately, you were thrown into this world. <laughs> you got to live with it. What can be hard about this is sometimes we use some of this colloquial language a little bit around when we say gene expression, what we mean is how do we measure which of those gene sequences in the DNA make it outside of the nucleus of the cell and into the rest of the cell. And that's, you know, it's, it's what we get used to because it's the stuff that we can measure. That's what we want to know about. In general, we wish we could measure the actual proteins that get expressed as the final product of that gene. We wish we could do that efficiently. And that's a whole nother field called proteinomics. Uh, and the problem has been, we can't do it reliably. It's very hard to capture that harvest that tissue and know that we're going to get the right result consistently. In fact, we know pretty well that we're not very good at doing that. Uh, and so that's why we use RNA. It's a, it's a little bit more. Uh, but you're right. The proteins adds a dimension to it because some of the um, activities are regulated by phosphorylation of proteins to kick basically protein into gear. And that's not captured by RNA. So there are some areas where protein may play a role for drug development. So this is not even touched. Um, so there is there's still a lot of work to do. Yeah, for, for those, of, those of you who may have been diagnosed 15 years ago or something, uh, where RNA and DNA might not have even really come up in the conversation very frequently, you might know that People took your slot, you know, a cut of a piece of your tumor and looked at it under a microscope. And we call that immunohistochemistry. And that is a way to look at the protein expression. We, we stain for certain proteins uh, on the surface of the cell, in some cases, sometimes inside the cell. And that is what was considered the absolute gold standard to differentiate subtypes of cancer cells for a very, very long time. And it still is the gold standard in certain contexts. Um, but we are finding out that we can 
look at some of these other tools and gain more information about how, how a cell behaves than we could with just immunohistochemistry. Uh, and so it's an exciting time because um, luckily for breast cancer, immunohistochemistry has helped divide treatment paradigms very effectively. Um, that hasn't really been true in lots of other cancer types. So we've touched on a few of them, but like lung cancer, we now know that that immunohistochemistry isn't really going to tell us whether we should use an EGFR inhibitor in that patient or not, right? We have to use gene testing to know that. And in colon cancer, as we've talked about, it may be RNA gene expression profiling that gives us the real differentiation of different subtypes. So we hope to get there soon. Um, and then for each cancer, we're, we're probably going to have to use different tools. So that's uh, okay. daunting, but we have a lot of really smart people working on it. So. <laughs> I mean, it's been a fascinating conversation. I don't know how I have not previously had the pleasure of meeting Dr. Lenz. I wish I had 15 years ago or so. Uh, there are so many things I would have wanted to ask him then. And now he's going to be bothered by me sending him emails. Uh, <laughs> Anytime. More frequently than he would like. But um, it's, it's always fun to mm -hmm. talk with somebody who thinks so deeply about these issues. And uh, I, I honestly, it's, it's a real pleasure for me. So... I have to thank Erica again for giving me the opportunity to talk to somebody that I otherwise wouldn't have had the chance to talk to. Um, and thank all of you for listening in. Um, any last words, Dr. Lenz? You've well, I would like to thank Erica and you for, for organizing that. And of course, Julie and Becky for joining us and everyone else, of course. Um, and I, hopefully this will help others to understand a little bit of the new developments. And you know that we're working very hard to really make it better. And I have no doubt we will. The problems uh, is will not overnight, but with all our help, we will force and change how we treat colon cancer in the future. And, and many other cancers, maybe all cancers. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and I, wanna, Matt, I would like to thank you, Dr. Lenz, for being so passionate for patients. No problem. And it's, that's the end game here. And we all know it and feel it. And we love you for it. Okay. Thank you so, so much for no joining us today. No problem. You thank too, you so Becky, much. and everyone else. Yeah, okay. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. So wasn't that wonderful? What an experience. Uh, we're so lucky to, to be joined by the likes of Dr. Lenz and Dr. Chris. Every one of these conversations is just fabulous. Thank you, Mirati. Thank you, Natera. Thank you, thank you, CGEN. Thank you, Colorectal Cancer Alliance. And thank you, Colon Cancer Coalition. Now, my last ask for you is that you go to our One Cancer Place channel on YouTube. Like us, subscribe, and get our notifications. Thank you again. Have a wonderful rest of the day.